So Luke, thanks for joining us today. There's been a lot of discussion and conversation around the weather conditions in Tokyo. Why is this? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. There's been lots of conjecture, both in the popular press and in the scientific literature. So it certainly will be the, the hottest and most humid Olympics to date, but the emphasis is to date. The, it's highly likely with the increasing globalization of elite sport over the last uh, 20 years, we've seen the Olympics, the FIFA World Cup in continents we've never seen it before. And prospectively over the next 10 years, we'll see, see that happening uh, more often. So yeah, it's gonna be really hot, really humid, and it's gonna be challenging for the athletes, the spectators, and the staff working in those environments. So it's a real interesting challenge for um, staff sending athletes to those games and a challenge for those athletes to perform at their best and ultimately hope to get a medal. And how do you envisage these the hot and humid conditions to actually affect athletes, coaches, supporters? Yeah, so the Olympics is so diverse, there's numerous sports within it. We could have someone competing for 9.5 seconds in the 100, or we could have someone completing the marathon. And away from track and field, we have a real variety of events. We could have modern pentathlon when we're not only dealing with the athletes getting very hot and humid, we have the horses as well. So it's a really interesting conundrum. But typically, the longer the event, the more marked the performance decrements will be, and the greater the challenge we see to performance and protecting athlete health. The shorter event, we could actually see some really good times in terms of the 100 metres as there's a quite strong relationship between muscle temperature and the ability to exert movement very quickly and powerfully. And we have those events which sit somewhat in the middle. So if we consider rugby sevens, we have a very short game for the athletes, the girls and guys, are expected to uh, produce movement, movement very quickly and repeatedly. So there's multiple challenges for the athletes to maintain their performance and the practitioners to try and help them maintain those performance levels and keep everyone safe. And is this the reason why we've seen certain events moved from Tokyo to other parts of the country? Certainly. Um, on the back of probably the IAAF, now World Athletics World Championships in Doha in 2019, where we were fortunate to conduct a big research project, we actually saw on the back of the quite sensationalist and evocative images going around the globe in the popular press. There's quite a big sea change from the IOC, really unprecedented uh, countermeasures moving the road races, so the marathons and the race walkers, from Tokyo north to Sapporo in an attempt to find more temperate conditions. But one, uh, due to COVID, we were actually able to see the day when the marathon should have run in 2020, when the games were originally scheduled. And the weather conditions weren't actually that different between Tokyo and Sapporo. And it was actually quite a bit more humid. And a lot of the um, practitioners and staff and those who commentate on those things um, are not 100% sure we'll actually see more favorable conditions in Sapporo compared to Tokyo. It's often much more humid. So we could have a few degrees C lower ambient air temperature in Sapporo compared to Tokyo, but we could have higher uh, humidity, for example. So it's not just a question of the air temperature, it's also how much water is in the environment as well. So could these conditions put athletes' health at risk? Yeah, so if I take you back to the World Championships, we, saw, we did see some sensationalist evocative images um, of athletes collapsing and being rushed to the medical tent. But it's quite interesting, there wasn't a single athlete admitted to hospital with exertional heat illness related pathologies. So although it was challenging, I think the excellent medical care which was on site, there was essentially a high capacity ICU at the finish line, prevented any major challenges to athletes' health. And if we consider those elite athletes, they're pretty good at um, moderating their exercise intensity to stay within the realms of their own individual thermoregulation. Of course, you will see um, sensationalist events, Callum Hawkins at the Commonwealth Games marathons, for example. But generally, we're pretty lucky in elite sport um, that athletes um, have strategies in place, well supported by the staff. And I'm sure the IOC is going to have a wealth of uh, protective measures in place to help those athletes stay safe and deal with any particularly high body temperatures. It's a little bit of a um, debate within the literature as well. One of the criteria to be diagnosed with exertional heat illness is a high body temperature, hyperthermia, typically over 40 degrees C. 
Um, however, we see in elite practice and elite competitions, that can be in um, rugby sevens, we've seen core temperatures of 41, 41.5 in the World Athletics Championships, in the um, World Cycling Championships. And these athletes, whilst having a high body temperature, don't present EHI, exertional heat illness related pathology. So um, it's a really interesting challenge and it's very individualised to every athlete. So the artificial conditions we see many athletes adapt, are they as good or as beneficial as actually being out in these climates? Yep, it's a really interesting question and it's a real trade-off between practicalities and barriers, the finances of the organisation and the athlete preferences as well. So if we talk about natural heat acclimatisation, so that's being in a hot environment, living and training in that environment, most would consider that's the gold standard best way to prepare for Tokyo or any competition in the heat. However, we know numerous athletes, geographical location, the funding available, whatever may be, simply don't have access to the funds or the ability to travel during COVID to go to those natural heat acclimatisation camps. So we have um, artificial or um, practice compatible methods where we can expose athletes to get them to do their normal training and they jump in a hot bath for X period of time and we know that can improve performance and um, facilitate those physiological and psychological adaptations to the heat that just doing a natural heat acclimatisation camp will do. In fact, there could some people might even suggest that being able to uh, stay in your own tr training environment, use a heat uh, a environmental chamber which you can get hot, or engage in some uh, sauna bathing or hot water immersion, post exercise, or wear additional clothing, or a combination of those measures, might be a positive compared to going away on a camp. As we know, if you go on a camp, generally you have some travel fatigue, jet lag, sleep quality might be lower. Um, you could have um, difficulty accessing the food, the volume, quantity or quality that you want, and just the general disruption being away from family and friends for those athletes for long periods of time. So it really is a trade-off, and I think natural uh, acclimatization and all of the logistics involved with that, and natural acclimation, they're becoming much closer in terms of the preferred prescription from the practitioners for the athletes. So I'd be happy if my athletes um, compete, uh, completing either of those preparation strategies before getting to Tokyo, alongside an effective match or race day cooling strategy. So ultimately, could that be down to the individual athlete and their needs and how they react to things? Certainly. There's athletes, just like all of us, there's athletes who don't like going away from home, missing their family. Um, particularly during COVID times where families can't drop in and out of camps, it's very difficult for everyone. So um, as I was saying previously, you've seen in the popular press, you've seen rooms filled with small greenhouses with athletes on what bikes preparing in that, in that manner. And we've got a lot of obviously Loughborough linked athletes heading out to Tokyo. How can they best prepare for these conditions? Long term heat acclimation or acclimatisation is the gold standard countermeasure to preserve athletic performance in the heat and provide some protection to um, exertional heat illnesses as well. And you'd hope all of the Loughborough and all the other athletes attending the Games have engaged in several blocks of heat acclimation or acclimatisation. Um, acclimatisation is in a natural hot environment like Japan, acclimation is generally an artificial environment, a laboratory, a hot bath, a sauna, whatever it may be. And most athletes, particularly the endurance athletes and the intermittent sport athletes, will be engaged in various types of that. The real challenge at the moment is we have the global pandemic. So those athletes would often be jetting off several times in the lead up to Tokyo to engage in heat acclimatisation. But there's essentially no travel for most people. And certainly a few months ago, there was no travel for many people. So they're engaging in more practical measures. So some real simple things you can do is you'll go for a run and then jump in a hot bath to raise your body temperature and sweat rate, engage in sauna bathing. You can wear additional clothing. It's a whole host of things that you can do. So does that give an advantage to those athletes who are used to the warmer climates? Yeah, I think historically in some of the older conjecture around the area, you would always say those athletes living and competing in a hot, humid environment are going to do better when you come to a um, to compete against someone from a temperate environment in a hot, humid environment. 
But I think practice has really changed and everyone's dialed into what they should be doing with some barriers in place. If you live in the UK, it's, especially at the moment as it's raining outside, you're going to struggle to get good quality heat acclimatisation. But it doesn't have to be a really sexy solution. Um, Callum Hawkins was quite widely reported as collapsing at the Commonwealth Games. Um, whilst at the Doha 2019 World Championships, he came fourth in the world-class field in probably some of the most arduous uh, elite marathon running conditions ever seen. And his solution was to buy some heaters from Aldi, put them in his uh, shed in his garden in Scotland somewhere and compete hours and hours to do that. So that very Blue Peter type approach has nearly got him a medal in a world-class field. So it doesn't have to be a one million pound heat chamber or a hundred thousand US dollar training camp somewhere exotic. There are other solutions available. And in addition to that, with selection being pushed back so much later, do you think that would impact negatively on the individual athlete's preparation with regard to heat? You're hedging your bets somewhat to wait for selection and then be doing your heat work. Um, it'd be more prudent to gamble somewhat that you would be selected and have engaged in heat acclimation or acclimatisation throughout the preceding year. In practice, we try to have a big block of heat acclimation early in the season because once someone's heat acclimatised or acclimated, you actually can expose them to fewer days than that initial block to get them reacclimated. So probably in this period of time, we're seeing athletes reacclimatise if they've got their preparation perfect and they're having to integrate that into their athletic taper where we basically reduce the exercise total volume generally to consolidate those physiological and psychological adaptations leading to best performance. So we've talked about the athletes. So have the hot and humid conditions driven any technological changes from whether it be the IOC or any of the world governing bodies? Previously, if you were engaged in exercise in the heat and you had a scientist or a sports scientist or a medical doctor, whoever, wanting to understand how your body responded, you would either have to be in a laboratory with a thermometer inserted into your body somewhere, shape or form, not very good for competing on in a rugby game or whatever may happen. Um, technological developments allow you to swallow a temperature pill now, which initially, probably five, six years ago, meant you had to physically catch up with that athlete, place a device on them to read the core temperature. But now the pills uh, are really technologically advanced. You can swallow the pill and it will data log and save the core temperature every 15, 30 seconds or a minute. And you can download that retrospectively by placing a device near an athlete for two to five minutes. So it's really allowed us to understand just how hot and when the athletes get hot and the efficacy, how, how well cooling maneuvers work. So those technological advances are in place. Um, probably the, something that will be piloted um, at the Games. There's a proof of concept project I'm fortunate to be involved with with, with Aspatar Sports Medicine Hospital, another IOC Research Centre partner, and the University of Brighton with uh, Professor Yanis Pistilalis and Sebastian Rassanet. We're uh, conducting a proof of concept project where the core temperature pill you inge ingest will actually t um, via Bluetooth transmit that to a watch along with some other sensors looking at skin temperature, heart rates, some biomechanics and gate work. So all those sensors integrate into a gateway, which is generally a watch, and that beams it to the cloud, and then anyone in the world can view their athlete's physiological and, uh, physiological and performance responses wherever you are in the world. And that's a proof of concept, not only for elite sport and future Olympic games, but also in some um, slightly different scenarios, occupational, the army, a disaster emergency workers, those types of things. So there's some real interesting technological developments, but with that, you have some ethical considerations. If your athlete's got a core temperature of 41.5 degrees C, and you can see it on your performance dashboard, what do you do? Do you pull them from the race or not? So with most technology, there's ethical constraints which arise, whether it's self-driving cars or um, understanding how hot someone's getting during exercise. Also, you kind of touched on it there, but has your own research also helped to, to shape and develop what the, the bigger governing bodies are thinking in these kind of events? Um, you don't want to blow one's own trumpet, so to speak, but definitely some of the work that I've been leading and involved with here at Loughborough and elsewhere has shaped some practice and standard operating procedures for, for numerous competitors uh, competing in the Olympics, whether it's their long-term preparation, heat acclimation, acclimatisation, um, adopting some practical solutions. Um, during COVID, we've had 
athletes and teams in several greenhouses in the space with heaters in them so they're socially distanced able to do their heat acclimation rather than all together in a chamber and wearing additional clothing and then on the race or match day as well cooling procedures wearing ice vests during warm-ups and there's a whole array of athletes and disciplines where fortunate to have my research and that of the wider research team feeding to in rugby sevens uh, track and fields um, a whole a whole host of events